Welcome everyone to the first live edition of Fair Territory. We're thrilled to be with you on YouTube and X, and we've been promising a new co-host for about a week now. You can see who that co-host is. You guys all know who she is. It's Alana Rizzo. Alana, Hi, welcome Ken. To Fair Territory. Welcome to Foul Territory, the whole family. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so honored uh, to be with you. I, I've known you for decades. I've always admired uh, the work that you've done. We've worked together in the same places, but never really been able to do a show together. So I'm excited. I'm grateful that uh, you're willing to have me tag along on Fair Territory and definitely happy to be part of the Foul Territory family as well. Well, thanks, Alana, and no need for those compliments. I'm just happy someone who works with Chris Mad Dog Russo would be willing to work with me. Because let's face it, yes. I don't have as much yes. energy as the dog, as much bite and bark. But anyway, Alana, it's amazing that you joined the show on this particular day in a week in which it almost appears that baseball is burning down. We've got the Shohei Otani situation. We've got the union. We've got a lot going on. We had the Dodgers play the Padres in their second game today. We had Michael Lorenzen sign with the Rangers or agree with the Rangers last night. But obviously, Alana... The biggest story in baseball is Otani and what exactly happened with his interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara. We do know the Dodgers have fired Mizuhara. We do know that ESPN had interviewed Mizuhara for 90 minutes in which he gave a detailed account about what exactly had happened with his involvement with gamblers. Now, this is all stemming from a federal investigation into a bookmaker with whom Mizuhara was placing bets. He told ESPN that Otani essentially helped him pay off his debt. Next day, if you haven't been familiar with this story, the spokesman who set up that interview, the spokesman who said, hey, this was what has happened. Mizuhara was helping Otani, or Otani was helping Mizuhara pay off these debts. They disavowed that story. Otani's attorneys come out and say, no, no, no. Otani was the subject of massive theft. That is what is going on here. Mizuhara at that point retracts everything or claims to retract everything. And yet I find it extremely odd and disturbing that here he is sitting down for 90 minutes, giving an interview to ESPN, Alana, and then suddenly, whoa, not that story. I got to give you another story or these lawyers are going to give you another story. That is the first big question the first red flag here. Now, before I get your thoughts, Alana, I want to make it clear. Shohei Otani has not been accused of doing anything wrong. There is no investigation right now by Major League Baseball, though I am sure that at some point the league will look into it. They, in these situations, are generally content to let the federal investigation or whatever investigation might be going on outside their jurisdiction take effect, and then they will decide what to do. What is illegal in baseball? It's illegal to bet on baseball. It's illegal to bet with illegal bookmakers. That's prohibited. But Otani, from what we know, was not doing that. Mizuhara was not betting on baseball. So this all needs to play out. And again, I caution people to reserve judgment and not pass judgment. As much as we're all inclined to have our opinions, we just don't know enough yet. And we'll know more in the coming days and weeks and there's one more thing I want to say before we get to Alana. Obviously, this could not be more uncomfortable for the sport of Major League Baseball, for the league, and for everyone who loves the sport. Otani, we all know he's the golden child. He's the ticket. He is the highest paid player in history, the biggest star in the game, the two-way sensation. And yet, it's somewhat inevitable that a gambling scandal, if this is what this turns into, was going to occur, not just in baseball, but in other sports. Let's face it. Baseball has relationships with gambling companies. Every one of my employers, The Athletic, Fox, Fair Territory, Foul Territory, they have relationships with gambling companies. 40 or almost 40 of the 50 states have legalized sports betting. So it's not a great shock, Alana, that it's kind of come to this, or at least we have a story like this going on right now. 
And Kenny, the one state that doesn't allow legal sports betting is the state of California. And that happens to be where, of course, Otani um, resides. And again, I do not want to speculate. It's very uh, irresponsible to speculate about Otani's involvement of this. I'm going to go ahead and give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, I don't know that Ipe is the fall guy in the situation. Perhaps he is, perhaps he is not. But it is a black eye on the sport of baseball when you think about it. As you mentioned, the golden child, the unit unicorn uh, that is Shohei Otani, you know, you're supposed to be celebrating the fact that this is a guy that has signed the biggest contract in all of professional sports, and he gets to make his Dodger debut. Uh, we can get into the timing of, uh, you know, when the, the games were uh, at another time, but it is horrible to think that this could be more than what we know so far. And I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I do think that, you know, it's smart of Major League Baseball to say, OK, we'll let the federal government, the feds do the investigation and see what they come of it, because it would be a massive black eye on the sport if Otani knew more than what we think he did at this point. I will say this. The Dodgers will have to have Otani address this. I don't like the fact that he was not made available to reporters after the game to discuss this. Again, perhaps he's being told that he shouldn't. Maybe that's the legal advice that he's been getting at this time. But they will have to address this at some point. That's my guess, Alana, that they're basically telling him, listen, you can't talk right now. And I want to point out a couple more things before we move on here. And we're going to take your fan questions. That's going to be a big part of the show. So that's going to happen shortly. But... Baseball has a rule, Rule 21, and we're going to put that rule up for you and show you what it is, and then I'll explain where this whole thing might be going with regard to Rule 21. That rule states that any player, umpire, or club, or league official, or employee who places bets with illegal bookmakers or agents for illegal bookmakers shall be subject to such penalty as the commissioner deems appropriate in light of the facts and circumstances of the conduct. That is what I was referring to before. You cannot bet with illegal bookmakers on any sport. Now, if Otani was in contact with these bookmakers, obviously it's not a great look. We can definitely say that without any real hesitation, but it's not necessarily a violation of the policy. In fact, it probably isn't. And even if the investigation determined that he was the one who placed bets with an illegal bookmaker, baseball had this in 2015 with Jerry Cosart, and all he got was a fine. So again, there is so much more that has to play out here. And while this is all going on, Alana, you referenced this. We have baseball being played. The Dodgers today, or earlier this morning, whatever you want to call it, lost to the Padres 15-11. Big story out of this game. There was a ton that happened, of course. But Yamamoto lasting only one inning in his Major League debut. This is the highest paid pitcher in Major League history, $325 million. He lasted one inning. Didn't have a great spring. And I saw his last spring start, which was not great. And the Dodgers felt that the pitch sequencing was off. The pitch calling wasn't necessarily where it should be. And this is what happens when a pitcher comes over from a different league, a different world entirely. There are going to be adjustments. Alana, wondering what you saw. Well, first of all, I find it awkward or interesting, rather, that the Dodgers spent a billion dollars in investments over Shohei Otani and Yoshinobu Yamamoto, and this is kind of what they got out of out of the weekend. Um, it's unfortunate <laughs> to think that, but here's what I think when I think about this outing so far from, from him. It was not a good look, obviously, not being able to get out of the first inning uh, without you know giving up a five spot. But I do believe that if he's going to be successful, Kenny, at the major league level in this country, he's going to have to get more comfortable quickly with pitching high and tight. He's got to go in on guys. And I think that's the way that position players are going to know that they can get to him because he's afraid to pitch in. And if he's pitching you know, away from them, it's going to be a situation where they're going to be able to adjust to him faster than they can, than he can adjust to them. And I think you're going to see that a lot of times Japanese pitchers don't are they're they're almost petrified to hit a guy, so they don't pitch in. And I think that's kind of what you're seeing here. I'm not super worried about him. I think it's going to take some time to get him adjusted. The spring training outings were not good. You saw the ERA that was north of eight in his spring training outings. 
I mean, he didn't pitch a lot of innings either in, in the spring, but he does have swing and miss stuff. He does have that strikeout ability, but he's got to get more comfortable with being able to pitch inside the guys or he's going to continue to have these issues. But again, I'm thinking, man, what a terrible outing from him. But that's not even close to the biggest story coming out of the, you know, what the Dodgers did uh, over the course of the weekend. That's right. And Alana, his great strength is his command. So I would presume he's going to figure it out. And I remember after we watched that last spring start at the Dodgers facility in Glendale, I was with John Heyman and Bob Nightingale, two other national baseball writers. And John said, could it be that all these teams that offered 300 million were wrong? And we all kind of came <laughs> to the conclusion, no. Other things in this game that were interesting, Max Muncie, two errors at third base. After we heard all spring that his defense was going to be so much better, it still might be, of course, it's one game. We're not going to go crazy over it, but that had to be alarming to some degree. Mookie, meanwhile, at shortstop has been brilliant. He goes four for five in this game with a home run, a double, six RBIs. He was amazing. And the Dodgers, after falling behind, they kept coming back. That's the good news. But for the Padres, this was an encouraging win in its own right. And keep in mind, after Yamamoto was out, they put up 10 on the Dodgers' bullpen. And you saw Jake Cronenworth, the guy who struggled all last year. Dude went 4 for 4 with a triple mm -hmm. off Yamamoto, 4 RBIs. Manny, the big three-run homer late when it was 12-11, made it 15-11. That was that. So for the Padres, there were some encouraging signs here. I don't worry about the Padres lineup, and I certainly didn't worry about the Padres lineup last year. They, they didn't perform the way that they needed to, but there's a couple of things that came out of these two games, Ken, that really stood out to me. Number one, we talked about it earlier on foul territory, that Mookie Betts already, I understand it's early, guys. It's two games. I get it. I mean, this is the first two weeks are the overreaction time of the century, right? That's when we overreact in baseball. But Mookie Betts, how many guys, Ken, have come from the outfield being willing to play in the infield at second base than out of necessity because Gavin Lux isn't necessarily ready to play shortstop for the Dodgers yet because of some arm throwing woes have had that much success at the most demanding defensive position in the game. Mookie Betts is an athlete. You ask anybody, he's the best athlete in the game. I don't worry about what he can do at short because he's just so athletic. Max Muncy has admitted that he needs to come in and be a more complete player. You know what you're going to get from Max Muncy. You're going to get a year of probably 30 or more home runs. You're going to get the on base. You're going to get the patient at bat. You're going to get the walks, but you're going to have a guy that's probably not hitting for average, right? He wants to get the average up and he definitely needs to work on his defense, but who are the other options? You know who the other option would have been, in my opinion, for third? Justin Turner. And they let Justin Turner get away. So what options do they have? They say, okay, Max Muncy is better at first than he is at third. Well, they have a all-star first baseman in Freddie Freeman. So he has no choice to, but to get better defensively to shore up that glove at the Keystone Corner. I would agree with that. And the Mookie thing is fascinating, Alana. I wrote about it about a week ago. And man, just what he is doing. And you said, has there ever been a guy to do this, to go from the outfield to one of the most demanding infield positions at such a high level. No, there has not been a player to do that. Right. There's only been one player in history to win a gold glove in the outfield and the infield. It was Darren Erstad, and his gold glove was at first base, not shortstop. So much different scenario there. Now, moving on. A couple other things before we get to your questions. The state of the Major League Baseball Players Association. You might have read some articles in recent days. Evan Drellick and I wrote. Evan wrote some on his own as well. We've had some other things in The Athletic on this particular issue. It's fascinating. And what has happened, to sum up a very complex situation, is that a sizable percentage of players have made it known that they would like the removal of the number two guy at the union, the lead negotiator, Bruce Meyer. Tony Clark the head of the union, is the only one who can remove Meyer. You can't vote as a union to get the number two guy out. Tony Clark, as the head of the union, is the one who has that authority, and he has resisted removing Bruce Meyer. So the question then becomes, can the group of dissidents led by Harry Marino, who was the guy who organized the minor leaguers when they unionized, can they somehow gain power here? And it remains to be seen how this is all going to play out. Tony Clark has resisted replacing Bruce Meyer. That has only galvanized factions on the other side. Alana, I'm not sure where this is going, 
And I know there are people questioning the strength of the union going forward. I will make one point on that. The next CBA negotiations or the next CBA situation doesn't come up for another couple of years. The deal does not expire until December 1st, 2026, if I'm not mistaken. So the Players Association has time to get it together. And what they're going through might ultimately be looked at as a healthy process to simply get themselves on the same page. But right now, there is a lot going on, a lot of tumultuous conversations taking place. And it all kind of is coming to a head because the season is starting. Once the season starts, the players are going to be worried about playing and not so much this off the field stuff. But this has been a fascinating few days. If you're interested at all, and I know a lot of fans aren't, in labor relations and how the union management relationship works in baseball. And I think the timing of it all is interesting. I don't know that, as you mentioned, Kenny, I think once the regular season gets going for all 30 teams, the players are not going to have the bandwidth to want to deal with labor negotiations and, and labor, you know, being uh, upset about certain things going on in the union. It almost feels to me like this is almost personal vendettas for certain people uh, within the union structure that want to see the change. This is what I would ask. I would ask every players, particularly every team representative that is part of the union to make sure the remainder of your teammates know exactly what is going on. It was my understanding that there was about half of the the clubhouses at spring training that weren't even aware that uh, this was something that was even being discussed, the removal of Bruce Meyer. So I, I think it, it would, you know, it would behoove, to use an old uh, Jim Tracy line, it would behoove the player reps um, that are part of the union to make sure the remainder of their teammates know exactly what is going on, is it exactly what is being asked of Tony Clark in terms of removing Bruce Meyer and what that would mean as far as a change um, from a, a, an attorney standpoint to represent the union, because you may not understand the implications of what it means if Tony decides, and, and Tony has already said, Mr. Clark has already said that he's not going to uh, ask Bruce Meyer to leave um, and, and replace him with anybody. So I think information is important that these guys know what is going on. And again, I think once the regular season starts, this is this is going to kind of, you know, get get brushed under the rug because they're not going to have the bandwidth to deal with these certain things. No, you're absolutely right. And we'll see how this all turns out. And certainly, Alana, you hit the nail on the head. This is very political. There are all kinds of factions here. There are all kinds of interests. And communication has been one complaint of the players, that the union has not been good enough mm -hmm. communicating. Not all players feel that way. But some do. There are other complaints as well. And one of them, of course, is the free agent market. Now, the free agent market, mm -hmm. we've seen what has happened. And we've seen for many players, it's been quite disappointing. Now, when you talk about the CBA and the players say, well, we agreed to a bad CBA. Guys, you agreed to this CBA. That right. was only two years right. ago. So that's on you. And if you don't like it two years in, well, hey, then you should have gone out and struck. But... That's not what happened. And no one wants that to happen on either side. No one wants to miss time. But to effect real change, and this is going to be an issue in the next CBA negotiations, you might have to miss real time. So that is a problem. And we saw last night when Michael Lorenzen agreed to a deal with the Texas Rangers, far below what he made last year, one year, four and a half million. This is the kind of thing that some might say is the problem. And others might say this is the natural course of events in a free market. Some players do well, some players do not do as well. Now, spending is down $1 billion from last offseason. So clearly there has been a change in the market for a variety of reasons. I've been writing about them all year, all, all offseason. The RSN uncertainty, certain teams choosing to pull back. It's been an odd market, no question about it. But... When a guy like Lorenzen signs for four and a half, and when you see some of the other deals that have taken place in recent weeks, even the bigger ones like Snell and Chapman and Bellinger, you do wonder where this is all going. Now, let's talk about the Texas Rangers a little bit before we move on, Alana. They are quite a fascinating team. Now, I don't know where Lorenzen will fit in the rotation exactly coming out of spring training and starting the season. He might only be built up to be a reliever, which he has been in the past. 
They've got Avaldi and John Gray and Dane Dunning and Andrew Heaney and Cody Bradford. They can go with that five. Then in the second half, we know this, they are hoping to have Jacob deGrom, Max Scherzer, and Tyler Molly. You can look at the rotation right there. That's the current group. Now, maybe Lorenzen gets in there instead of Bradford early on. I don't know the exact plan yet. His physical is today. He's got to pass the physical, obviously. But you look at the future help right there, Alana. It's quite an interesting group, to say the least. My question to you is this. Why did they decide not to bring back Jordan Montgomery? I don't understand how Jordan Montgomery is not a Texas Ranger or on any team, which also brings me back to Ken to this question, Kenny. Is the situation with some of these big free agents, the Cody Bellingers of the world, the Blake Snells of the world, not getting the contracts that they wanted because of agents, not necessarily just Scott Boris, but because of agents over promising? When you are Cody Bellinger and you're asking for $200 million and you end up signing for 80, when you're Blake Snell and you think you're worth 230 and you had allegedly a $150 million contract on the table that you don't take and you end up signing for whatever it was, two years, 46 million with the Giants, is that a situation of agents over promising? How Jordan Montgomery is not signed, I don't know. I like the Michael Lorenzen sign, but the... Texas Rangers rotation to start until they get the reinforcements that are going to come in those big names that you mentioned, that rotation does not strike fear in me. Minus okay, Nathan Alvarez. Okay, here. Gotcha. Jordan Montgomery, the reason he is not signed with the Texas Rangers is because Rangers ownership has basically put this offseason to some degree on hold. And they have balked at giving out any big deals. And they've given out some big deals in recent years. We know that. But because of their uncertainty with their future local television revenues, the ownership has basically said, we don't want to go there. Now, I object to this line of thinking with regard to this particular team. This particular team just won the World Series. You make money after exactly. winning the World Series. This particular team is hosting the All-Star Game. You make money when you're going to host the All-Star Game. More people buy season tickets. So... In my view, the Rangers explanation or ownership's explanation, because this is not a front office decision. The front office would have wanted Jordan Montgomery. Ownership is unduly panicking, in my opinion. Now, to the question of overpromising and agents and specifically Scott Boris, because let's face it, he's the central figure here. I wrote about him a couple of days ago and I took a harsh look at the way his offseason has gone. And what I said is that when you're assessing free agent contracts, how are they judged? They are judged by guaranteed money. They are not judged by the number of opt-outs and flexibility. Now, Boris's point is that he could have had long-term deals for these players, but they prefer because of where they were in their careers, this is because of the money they've made, Snell and Bellinger have done well, that they wanted that optionality, as he calls it. They wanted the ability to go back in the market next year when perhaps the market will be better when some of this RSN uncertainty will be resolved, when things will be more stable. Now, it's hard to say he is wrong because he's done this before. Carlos Correa signed a one-year deal, then hit the big deal later with the Twins. And then you go back to 2018-19, Boris did not have a great offseason. And then the next offseason, he crushed it. That was Scherzer and Strasburg and Rendon. I'm sorry, Cole, Strasburg and Rendon. So... You can't pass total judgment yet, but if you would have said to me at the start of the offseason that Blake Snell, Cody Bellinger, and Matt Chapman would get the deals they did, I would have said, whoa, 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 what happened there? And I want to point out one more thing. Even if you buy Scott Boris's argument that this is better for these particular players, okay, there have been some big deals signed this offseason, and I'm not just talking about Otani. I'm not even just talking about Yamamoto. Aaron Nola, $172 million. Eduardo Rodriguez, $80 million. That's as much as Cody Bellinger signed for. No disrespect to Eduardo, but I don't know that he is thought of as highly as Cody Bellinger in some circles. Hasn't won an MVP like Cody did. Hasn't been Rookie of the Year. So there has been money spent. Tyler Glass now signed an extension for more than Blake Snell got as a free agent. Negotiating with one team, admittedly the Dodgers, a team that was willing to spend. So... We'll see how it all plays out, 
But the way I wrote it was, at least in the short term, it did not work out well for the Boris clients. All right, Alana, we've talked long enough. Let's go to the questions now. Let's hear what the listeners and the viewers have to say, what they want to hear from us. Fire away, guys. All right, here we go. It's time right. for Grilling Ken. All right, let's see. I got to uh, pull this up here. Grilling Ken. All right, here we go. Ooh. Is it up there? Okay. Hey, Alana yeah. and Ken, we talk about the hot seat when it comes to skippers. What general manager should be on the hot seat this season? Wow, we're coming in hot. We haven't even, the season <laughs> hasn't even are. started. We're already talking about general managers getting fired. What do you think, Ken? I love it, first of all, just the idea of people already being disgruntled. You might have said Farhan Zaidi, <laughs> even though he just got a contract extension, but I'll talk about this a little bit later. Farhan Zaidi's had a good offseason, and he is answered some of the questions that were surrounding him. I can't think of any off the top of my head that would automatically be in trouble. Craig Breslow just got to Boston. And certainly there are some rebuilding teams maybe where you want to see some things happen in a quicker way. But for instance, in Detroit, Scott Harris, a relatively new general manager. In Kansas City, J.J. Piccolo is a new general manager for the most part. And I'm just not seeing where anyone in particular would be in trouble. I'm trying to think here a lot. You got any ideas? I know, especially in the central divisions. I feel like, unfortunately, the central divisions are kind of the, for lack of a better word, the mediocre division. So when you're talking about the Kansas City Royals, the Detroit Tigers, you know, the Chicago White Sox, those type of things, I don't think that any of those general managers are going to be on the hot seat because I just don't think that most folks think the central division teams are going to be the, you know, the heavy hitters in this one. Um, I, I, it's too early I for me one. to worry about general man. Okay, go ahead. I do have one Toronto, Russ Atkins. And really? they didn't do as much this off season as obviously they wanted to do. They were in on Otani in on Yamamoto, I guess, to some extent. So I could see there the urgency increasing. Now I know Yankee fans want me to say Brian Cashman, in theory, That's if the Yankees have happen. another disappointing season, <laughs> but <laughs> we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and it never seems to come to fruition. I'm just looking at the list of teams. Otherwise, I would say Ross Atkins would be probably the one most under scrutiny. And let's not forget also A.J. Preller in San Diego. He is one of the longest tenured general managers. He is a guy that has done a lot of tearing up and building up his roster, and yet – the view of many in the game, even among some of his detractors, is that he's had one of his better off seasons here, that he did a really good job in getting the group of pitchers from the Yankees and then turning, of course, one of them into Dylan Cease. They're playing Jackson Merrill. They're mixing in Paulson as well. They're going to have some kids finally on their roster contributing. But certainly with the uncertainty in their ownership situation, with the passing exactly. of Peter Seidler, A.J. Preller could be a candidate to be dismissed. And going back to Toronto for just a second, I mean, Atkins is the window is closing there, Ken, because you think yes. about the fact that Dante Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. have two more years together, right, before they hit free agency. And the time is now for these these this team to to figure it out and not only get to the postseason again, but to win postseason series. So the time in which these they have this team together uh, is running out as far as Padres are concerned. Um, that's interesting. What about Depoto in Seattle? I mean, is is that another one that? I mean, this is a guy that loves trading guys uh, and and moving pieces more than anybody else. What's your opinion on Jerry Depoto with the Mariners? He's a controversial. Remember the fifty four percent line, of course. Yeah, upset so many people. <laughs> they too, in my opinion, have had a pretty good off season. Now they missed last year, but part of their issue is ownership not wanting to spend and go the full mile and. This offseason, basically, they had to retrench, and then DePoto had to kind of figure things out, and he did. They've got very strong pitching. They should be pretty mm -hmm. good. They're good up the middle. I don't see him necessarily being in trouble, but these are all good questions, and I appreciate you guys bearing with me here because when you're asking me the question live at Alana Live, we might have to get our bearings a little bit, but we came up with some there, so let's go <laughs> to the next one.
<laughs> yeah, we're all trying to figure out the logistics of, of everything going uh, on. All right, so Patrick Pelton has this question for you, Kenny. Any other depth to add to the news on Monty and the Yankees? How close were they with Lorenzen and when they checked in last week? I can't imagine they were close on Lorenzen because if they would have spent $5 million, they would have had him, right? He only signed for four and a half. So it's really an interesting question how serious they are with Montgomery. They haven't been serious all offseason. They had been talking about Snell and to Snell. Now, with Montgomery, the only guy left on the board or the main starting pitcher left, Mike Clevenger is still out there. I don't see them necessarily doing it for all the reasons that they weren't going to do Snell, luxury tax and that kind of thing. But with Montgomery, it's a little bit different. He didn't get a qualifying offer because he was traded in the middle mm -hmm. of a season. So you could give him a longer deal with opt-outs and lower the AAV that way. That's not inconceivable. So I don't know how serious the Yankees are going to be. I don't know if those talks are really even legitimate or not. But Jordan Montgomery, he would be a good fit. The other question there is, does he want to go back to the New York Yankees? It didn't end all that great there for him. Remember, they traded him because they felt he didn't or wasn't good enough to be part of their postseason rotation. He said, uh, they did some things with me that I changed and got a lot better when I got out of there. So I'm not sure his desire is there, but at the same time, what are we a week away from opening day and he's still not signed. That's so what I was getting. That's what I was getting. Yankees I mean, would be is, a little appealing. It's his desire to pitch or is a desire to prove a point. <laughs> right. I mean, it's interesting I, at this point. And again, even if he signs now, it's still going to take him three to four weeks to get stretched out and, and be ready to, to pitch. So it's not like you're getting well, a guy that's, that's ready to go question. on opening day. That, that's another interesting question because Scott Boris has insisted that his guys are going to be ready, that Snell is going to be ready to go. Snell said that yesterday in his news conference that he's close. Maybe Jordan Montgomery yeah, is but too. You, you, but can't, you can't simulate game action, though. You can't simulate that, you know, agree. live hitters I'm, in a I'm game. I don't, care. I don't care how fancy the, uh, you know, the training center is with the Boris Corp. It's not facing real hitters in a game, albeit a spring training game. It's not a real game. That's my opinion, Alana, as well. But, of course, you know, Scott has his own thoughts. All right, let's go All move right. on. To the next <laughs> All right, it is time now for the last question, and then we're going to go ahead to get to dude of the week and dork of the week. Alana and Ken, who do you expect to be most competitive with mm. the Dodgers, the D-backs, the Padres, or the Giants? I have to say, Kenny, I love now what the Giants have done in terms of their pitching staff, of course. Um, but I'm not, I am not going to ever uh, question what the D-backs can do, considering uh, that they were the only team that believed in themselves last year and they ended up in the World Series. What's your take on it? First of all, that's a great question. And I wrote about the Giants today. And my question that I posed in the column was, how good are they? Are they a legitimate playoff team now? And in the National League, basically, we have the Braves and the Dodgers up here. And we've got all the other teams that are competitive, kind of in a slog, right? Competing for the three wild cards, as well as the NL Central title. The Giants, at least if you look at the projections and believe the projections, are kind of at the top of that group now, or should be. I'm not totally convinced that they're going to hit. I don't know. And the Diamondbacks, I like what they've done this offseason. I like the fact that they have young players who are still improving, and they've got Gallon and Kelly and Eduardo Rodriguez. So I would say that would be my choice because I still don't believe in the Padres entirely. Their starting pitching is really good. They're diminished in the outfield. I don't know, the bottom of the order, not great, even though today they scored 15. <laughs> I just am not <laughs> convinced by them. So I'll pick the Diamondbacks in that question. All right. And uh, by the way, the highest ever opening day payroll for the Arizona Diamondbacks. They made that commitment, of course, um, after going to the World Series. All right. Is it time now for uh, Dude of the Week and Dork of the Week? It is time. All right. So this is my first one uh, of doing this with you. Been, this is the first fair territory that's ever live. And I'm so grateful to be able to join Ken on these things. But let's start with Dude of the Week for you. Who is it? It's Farhan Zaidi. As the Giants president of baseball operations. We segue nicely here into Farhan. And <laughs> they've taken a lot of heat, the Giants have, for their inability to sign certain free agents. And Harper was one, Judge was another, Shohei Otani, Yamamoto. But in the past two off seasons, they have spent a lot of money on free agents. 
almost 200 million last off season. This off season, more than 320 million. But the reason Farhan is due to the week is because he played it perfectly with the two big Boris clients. He got Chapman for 54 million. He got Blake Snell for 62 million. That's 116. That's barely more than he gave Jung Hoo Lee, another Boris client who is coming over from Korea. So for his negotiating and for waiting out the market and getting the prices that he wanted, and I know Scott Boris loves these deals, but guess what? I'm sure the Giants love them even more. So Farhan Zaidi is taking a lot of heat. He's put together a much more entertaining team, I would expect, and probably a much better team. We'll see where it goes, but he is my dude of the week. Yeah, Justin Yamas thinks that Chapman is a much better defensive upgrade over J.D. Davis anyway. Okay, let me. Uh, my dude of the week for the first one is um, Joey Votto. First of all, it's no secret I think this man is a two nation treasure. I'm obsessed with Joey Votto. I love everything that he is about. I, I just I think he's a great human being um, and just an awesome person. But to me, the reason he's due to the week this week, Ken, is because he could very easily just ride off into the sunset. He's made a bazillion dollars. He has nothing else to prove. But he said, you know what? I still want to play. I have something left to give. And he says, you know what? I know that I'll probably start the regular season in the minor leagues, and I'm willing to earn my way to the major league roster. How many guys would do that with the resume that Joey Votto has? Not many, if any. That's a great choice. No question about it. So I guess we should get to the dorks of the week, right? Yes, dork of the week. And it's All funny, right. too, because your dude of the week was San Francisco, but your dude is also San Francisco. It absolutely is, Alana, and for good reason. Now, I know teams don't value public address announcers and even broadcasters the way they do players. That's the way of the world. However, when you have certain public address announcers and certain broadcasters, they become institutions. They become part of the fabric of your team. They become popular. They become people that you want to keep as long as you can. What am I getting to? I am getting to the Giants parting of ways with their public address announcer, Rennell Brooks Moon. Now, she is the first female public address announcer they've ever had. She is also great at her job. That's more important. And she's someone that endeared herself to fans endeared herself to players, especially the black players on the Giants. She had an affinity or a relationship with some of them. And she's just someone who, as I said, should be considered an institution, not someone you throw to the side. So the San Francisco Giants, for being tone deaf, for making a decision that is, in my view, inexplicable, dorks of the week. No question about it. She is synonymous to me, Ken, with the San Francisco Giants. I mean, she has been the voice, the PA voice of the San Francisco Giants since Oracle Park at the time, AT&T Park, opened 24 seasons that Rennell has been there. I mean, I don't I don't remember a game at, at Oracle Park that wasn't uh, with her uh, behind the microphone. So I agree with you there. My dork of the week is actually a current player, uh, Jazz Chisholm of the Miami Marlins. I understand, and I'm not saying that Jazz shouldn't be Jazz, but for him to publicly call out very thinly veiled, publicly calling out Miguel Rojas, a former teammate of him, to me is unacceptable. You can act the way you want to act. I love I love his charisma. I love um, the way that he goes about the game. I love the personality. But to publicly call out a former teammate who is acting in his own right, in his own way, um, to me is wrong. And Jazz Chisholm hasn't accomplished anything in the game to the level that Miguel Rojas has accomplished. Um, I don't understand the benefit that comes with a guy calling out a teammate about the way that he handled things in the clubhouse. There's certain things that you do as a veteran player in this game that I'm not saying that Jazz Chisholm has to do, but I don't like him getting on a veteran player for going about things the way that he was taught to go about things. All right, very good. There you have it. Now, what's great about having Alana is we get two dudes of the week and we get dudes of the week. So you heard the choices that we made for this week. And Alana, we've got a lot more to come.
And we do have a lot more to come. I'm excited again to, to be with you uh, on this fair territory with you, Kenny. And uh, by the way, I mean, I, I got to get this right because this is all about this was this is what pays our bills. Correct. So I want to make sure <laughs> that um, we can get this in here. Right. Thank you to bet MGM, which is so funny because we're always talking about the gambling situation yet. We're sponsored by them. But spin the wheel to reveal which March matchups 10 through 16 seed team you are given. If your assigned team makes it through to the sweet 16 of March matchups you will be eligible to split the 100,000 bonus bet grand prize pool with the other promotion winners. Bet MGM, by the way, for customers in North Carolina, place your first Bet MGM Sportsbook wager through Bet MGM Sportsbook mobile application of at least $5. You will receive $150 instantly in additional winnings, regardless of your wager's outcome. So is that it, Kenny? Did we do our first show together? We did, and I think it went great. I hope people agree. And Alana, I want to say Hi. one thing before we let you go. When we announced last week that we were going to have a co-host, but we were keeping it on the down low, we weren't going to announce it. We had a number of people in the YouTube comments say, I hope it's Alana Rizzo. Well, guess what? Aww. You got your wish. Alana, That's thank you so for joining nice us. To Thanks hear. to everyone for listening. Thanks to everyone for watching. Now you know where to find us. I'll do this part of it, Alana. I do it every week. Okay. I've actually finally okay, got go it ahead. down. I got it. I got to get. I got to get. I got to get. Yep. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. Sometimes we're on Twitter. You have to like us. You have to subscribe to us, and you have to follow us each week. We will be back Monday with the regular podcast and show on YouTube. Thank you. For, whoops. Thank you for everyone for joining us for your questions, and thank you, Alana. It's great to work with you again. Yeah, thank you, Ken. And don't forget, Foul Territory is back at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Then Ken is back on Fair Territory on Monday. And then myself and Clint Pasillas start Dodgers Territory on Monday as Ooh. well. Outstanding.